welcome to uh, class 14 on power electronics and distributed generation. We have been discussing some example problems uh, in the last class, we will continue with those problems. And people who are watching the video, the, my request is to try and work out the problems by yourself before watching the solutions. So, in the last class, we were working out uh, an expression for the reactance and uh, resistance of the line and we got an expression for the reactance, uh, the expression that is shown over here and the expression for the resistance of the line uh, which is uh, determined by the properties of the conductor and cross sectional area. Uh, so, uh, once you have the, 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 the in x and r values of the line, you could then plot the, the, the x by r ratio of the line. Uh, so, you can get an expression for your x by r ratio as some function of the occupied area and say the distance between the conductors and uh, check what its uh, typical value would be. Okay. And uh, this is what is asked in the next uh, problem, where uh, you are looking at uh, cross sectional area starting from 10 mm square, uh, square the, the occupied area rather than the cross sectional area from 10 mm square to 400 mm square. And for spacing between conductors from uh, uh, 5 centimeters, 10 centimeters and 25 centimeters. So, depending on what the uh, distance between the conductors are and for the case of uh, copper and aluminum. So, you can see that uh, when the cross sectional area of the conductor is small, uh, you have uh, low values of x by r which means that the wire is almost uh, resistive. So, at the consumption point within your house, uh, within a small establishment, uh, you can actually model the wire as a resistance that would be a good uh, approximation. Whereas, if you now go to the large cross sectional areas, you are having uh, larger x by r ratio. So, uh, for your feeder, your probably even at the secondary uh, distribution, depending on the cross sectional area of the wire, you can you have to actually consider the, the inductive effects. Uh, but for many distribution systems, the, the, the cross sectional area may not be as large as what is there for the transmission systems, which, which means that uh, compared to transmission systems, the distribution systems may have x by r ratios which are closer to 1, uh, whereas at uh, higher power transmission tr sub transmission, you might have uh, higher levels of x by r ratios that are seen for your conductor. Okay. Also, you can see that uh, the copper wire has a higher x by r ratio. So, the, the blue curves have x higher x by r ratios which uh, essentially is because uh, copper is a better conductor. So, its <coughs> resistance is small. So, the x by r ratio would be higher. Uh, you could also see that uh, when your, uh, your, uh, your spacing between the conductor is uh, large. So, for example, for 25 mm, uh, for, for 25 centimeter spacing, you have a higher value of x by r compared to 5 centimeter spacing, which means that uh, if you have a loop of wire, if you increase the distance between the conductors, you would have more inductance. So, this is to be naturally ex expected. Uh, so, if you want to have very low inductance, you want to bring the conductors closer by have a uh, uh, put in a small twist, so that you can actually ensure that the wires stay close by. So, you depending on the enclosed area for the flux, you can actually, so you can ex explain why the these curves look uh, in this particular manner. Okay. Then some of the assumptions behind uh, the nature of these curves, you can uh, see that uh, uh, we have assumed that the relative uh, permeability of the material is 1. So, uh, you are uh, 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 assuming that uh, there is no uh, 
uh, magnetic material in the wire, some of the uh, overhead lines what might have steel reinforcement to carry the weight of the wire. So, uh, we are ignoring uh, things like that. We are also derive the expression for a single phase uh, system, so two conductors. We are also assuming that the, the current uh, flows uniformly in the cross section of the conductor. Uh, so, even at 50 hertz, if your cross section is quite uh, on the larger side, your uh, skin effect can be quite uh, uh, a factor and has to be considered. So, we have ignored uh, things like skin effect and we are assuming uniform current distribution. Uh, we are also ignoring things neighboring uh, materials, you might have shields, you might have uh, raceways through which uh, you are passing your conductor. So, packaging effects, we are ignoring stranding effects, uh, so the, the conductors might itself be stranded. So, but it gives you a feel for what range to expect for your uh, uh, X by R ratio. Also, the resistance we have considered uh, resist, uh, the resistivity at 20 degree centigrade. So, at uh, higher temperatures, the resistance would be uh, higher. Okay. So, in the next problem, we are looking at uh, uh, the transient effects during fault. So, by that, uh, what we mean, uh, what I mean is, uh, uh, if you have a fault occurring at some instant then you want to see not just uh, what the steady state fault current is going to be, you are also going to, uh, to require what can be the fault current on shorter time frame basis. And once you have uh, a inductive uh, component in addition to the resistive component, you will have dynamic uh, effects in any uh, system. And uh, so, you want to see what could be the worst case uh, fault current or peak fault current to analyze uh, what is happening in the system. Okay. Uh, so, the, so, the simplified model that we have is of a, a wire which is modeled as a <coughs> R and, uh, 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 and a reactance term and the voltage as a sinusoidal voltage term and you are having a fault uh, that is occurring at some arbitrary point of time. So, and uh, so, so, say the fault occurs at some point theta f. So, before the fault occurred, the current in this particular loop was uh, 0 and uh, you can as you think of this uh, fault as uh, a switch, where the switch closed at the instant uh, theta f. Okay. So, the mo uh, so you, your analysis is uh, of a circuit, where the switch was open, a RL circuit where the switch was uh, uh, open initially and it closed at theta f and the source driving the uh, this, uh, this current, the fault current is a sinusoidal so source. Okay. So, the first question is to derive an expression for the steady state and the transient fault current as a function of time. So, for this model, we assume our source voltage V s is A sin omega t. So, a sinusoidal voltage and the circuit equation is simple L d i by d t plus r i is V s for t greater than t f and we know that i of t equal to 0 for t less than or equal to t f, the time at which the fault occurred. So, we can uh, write this in uh, a dynamic equation form. So, x dot is equal to A x plus B u and x at t naught is some x naught. So, uh, our equation in this case is d i by d t 
equal to minus r by l i plus 1 by l v s. Uh, so, we know what the general solution for such a equation is or x of t is uh, using the state transition matrix times x naught plus integral t naught to t phi of t comma tau b of tau u of tau d tau. And we know that the state transition matrix for this simple first order system is uh, e to the power of minus r by l t minus tau. So, you can write an expression for your i of t, it would have the form and for our case our i at t naught is 0. So, this term goes away. So, you have an expression for i of t is t f, t f to t So, this is uh, you need to integrate a, a exponential with a sinusoid. So, we can use an expression for uh, integral of that form e to the power of k t sin omega t d t is equal to e to the power of k t k sin omega t minus omega cos omega t by omega square plus k square. So, we will use this expression and substitute what we had in our previous uh, uh, equation. So, you get your i of t is equal to 0 for t less than t f and for t greater than t f greater than or equal to t f you have a by r square plus x square So, if you look at this particular term, say the, the first term, this is a term, the sinusoidal term, what you would expect normally when you excite a RL circuit with a sinusoid. The second term over here is a exponentially decaying term. So, that is the transient term. Okay. And this expression over here, the second expression is for T greater than or equal to T f. So, uh, our term 1 is the AC term and term 2 is the is a exponentially decaying term and you could take uh, uh, z is equal to r plus j x and gamma is equal to tan inverse x by r. So, gamma is the fault angle, the impedance angle. So, you could then rewrite this particular expression for i of t as uh, a by magnitude of z sin omega t minus gamma 
and a by magnitude of z sin of theta f minus gamma e to the power of r by x theta f minus omega t for omega t greater than or equal to theta f or t greater than t f. So, you can see that uh, essentially the first term is the A c term that is what you get from your uh, your phasor analysis. So, when you do uh, uh, three phase uh, fault analysis or uh, uh, sequence model analysis what you are actually getting is the first term. The second term is essentially a transient component and typically when you look at dynamical systems you assume that the transient component is being caused by uh, initial conditions. So, the initial conditions cause transients and the transients die away. In this case the transient is not being caused by initial condition it is being caused by the sudden application of a sinusoid. When we talk about a sinusoid it is occurring from minus infinity to infinity for all time whereas here you have a sinusoid which is up getting applied at theta <coughs> f that introduces a transient term. Okay. So, you can if you look at this particular expression you can see that uh, uh, if you look at the second term this is again the second term you have a component uh, 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 sin of theta f minus gamma. So, you can see that uh, depending on how theta f is related to gamma you can have different types of exp exponents. So, if theta f equal to gamma so if your fault is occurring exactly at the impedance angle of your RL network you will not have any uh, transient term. If uh, theta f is less than gamma then you would have a additional trans uh, uh, transient term which is adding to your your steady state uh, component and if theta f is greater than uh, gamma then essentially you would have a subtracting term ok. So, for a given x by r ratio if if theta f is less than gamma a transient exponential term is being added So, again if, if you look at that particular term we had yeah. uh, what we had was minus a by magnitude of z sin uh, theta f minus uh, gamma e to the power of minus r by x omega t minus theta f for omega t greater than or equal to theta f. So, if you take this particular term as k, uh, we can see that the k would have a maximum value when theta f minus uh, uh, gamma is equal to uh, minus pi by 2 okay, because you have a minus term over there. or gamma is theta f plus pi by 2. Uh, so, if your uh, uh, impedance angle is theta f plus pi by 2 then essentially you would have the maximum of this term and we know that uh, in physical systems the maximum value of uh, the impedance angle in a RL circuit is 90 degrees right. So, the uh, next point is to look at what theta f 
should be to actually uh, result in the maximum uh, peak for uh, fault current. Okay. So, you can if you look at the circuit that you have, uh, you have a, a RL circuit which is being excited by a sinusoid. So, you can see that if theta f happens before uh, 0, then essentially you are applying a negative volt second to the inductor. And if uh, theta f is greater than 0, you are having a positive volt second being applied on the uh, use you have actually a uh, positive volt second being applied being applied, but it is reduced compared to the volt second. for theta f equal to 0. So, if you look at the RL circuit, the maximum value of volt second that you would apply on the inductor, uh, because uh, the in integral of the voltage uh, volt second is proportional to the current to the inductor. So, the maximum volt second that you would apply on the inductor would be for uh, theta f equal to 0. So, to maximum ok. So, then we could actually uh, look at uh, the question that we had in the our question we were given uh, r by x of 1 by 3 and uh, magnitude of uh, the impedance to be 0 0.1 magnitude of z to be 0 0.1. Uh, so, in so uh, if you look at uh, what is being asked over here uh, for magnitude of the impedance being 0 0.1 and for these values of theta f uh, plot uh, and given r by x of 1 by 3, uh, look at the expressions for your fault current. So, what is plotted over here is essentially uh, uh, what is over here is the voltage V and what is shown over here is uh, the value of the current uh, for different values of uh, fault angle. Uh, so, this is for theta f equal to 0, this one is for theta f is equal to uh, 45 degrees and uh, this is for theta f equal to 90 degrees and uh, this particular case is for theta f equal to the blue line is for theta f equal to 71.6 which is the same as the impedance angle and you can see that the peak fault current uh, has reached steady state from the beginning there is no transient term. So, uh, only when theta f is different from your uh, fault angle of that uh, RL circuit would uh, you get uh, the transient term. For theta f is equal to 135 degrees, you have this pink line over here. So, you can see that uh, theta f equal to 0 uh, as expected gives you the, the peak uh, fault current. Okay. So, then uh, the next question is uh, uh, to locate the, the first peak of the fault current. Again, you can actually uh, uh, write an exp uh, uh, derive an expression for the first peak by looking at the fault current taking the derivative and setting it to 0. Uh, what we will uh, 
assume is that uh, this roughly occurs at the fault angle plus uh, uh, pi by 2. So, then you have an uh, expression for I p 1 is equal to A by magnitude of z sin of pi by 2 plus So, this is uh, again assuming that your theta f is uh, 0 which results in the maximum uh, uh, fault current. So, you can see this term over here this is uh, your uh, A by magnitude of z is your I p steady state. So, you can uh, write an expression for the ratio of your first peak in the fault current to your steady state current. So, for the numbers in the given problem this value is about 1.37 as your uh, peak uh, to steady state uh, fault current uh, value. Okay. So, if you then look at what could be the second peak you can get an expression for the approximate location of the second peak. So, at uh, uh, 2 pi uh, radians later or 360 degrees later. So, you can write an expression for I p 2 by I p 1 as So, for the numbers that we had in the problem this turns out to be 0 0.763 and then if you look at uh, I p 2 by I p steady state that would be the product of uh, this particular ratio times this particular ratio. So, this would be 1.37 into 0.763 is 1.04. So, you can see by the second cycle uh, uh, even with uh, x by r ratio of 3 your transient has died out. Okay. So, the transient depending for typical lines uh, especially in the distribution system may not last for too long, but uh, you have circuit breakers that can uh, open at any point because it uh, can open in response to a relay not just uh, uh, after measuring current and subsequent to that. So, you have to uh, give allowance for the peak current that can potentially flow because uh, if a breaker is opening and a high level of current is flowing the amount of uh, charged ions in the gap when the breaker is separated would be proportional to the current. Okay. So, it has to be does it needs to have the capability to interrupt uh, whatever peak can potentially flow.
So, in the next problem uh, you are asked to plot uh, the IP uh, the first peak by the steady state fault current uh, as a function of uh, uh, your x by r ratio uh, or r by x term and so r by x term being small would correspond to a circuit which is almost uh, inductive uh, r by x being large would correspond to a circuit which is almost uh, strictly resistive. So, you would like to see what the peak to uh, uh, steady state uh, fault current level is as a function of uh, your x by r ratio and you can see that uh, what is plotted over here is I p 1 by I p steady state. Uh, at uh, uh, r by x uh, ratio of 0 0.01 which this, this end would be inductive. You have almost twice the, the, the peak to uh, steady state current which is what you would expect in a, if you are just uh, exciting an inductor with a sine wave your peak current can have a, a big DC offset. Uh, which would take your peak to twice the value and you can see say for x, uh, r by x of uh, 0.1 you have a number which is uh, 1.74, uh, here it is about uh, 1.97, here we are talking about 1.1. So, if you are having an r by x ratio of uh, 10 it is uh, almost uh, just res uh, resistive. Your you do not see much of a transient term at all. Okay. And obviously, your uh, transient would be higher in the inductive case uh, compared to the resistive case. So, in the next uh, 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 case we are uh, we looked in problem 1 of a feeder with uh, which was 4 km, uh, kilometer long you had a transformer at the substation and uh, so you could then look at uh, what the x by r ratios of that particular example uh, is depending on whether it, uh, you have a fault close to the substation uh, midway at the feeder further down uh, towards the end of the feeder. Uh, you also have the case where what happens when you add a reactor to limit your peak fault current. You also have a single phase uh, fault case, the three phase fault case and you can look at the x by r ratios for uh, the, all these uh, different situations. So, you can see that uh, the general trend is that uh, the x by r ratio can be quite large uh, especially if you are uh, close to uh, the equipment such as transformers uh, etcetera, uh, but uh, further uh, down on the feeder your x by r ratios are more typical of what you could expect on a distribution system where uh, it is more resistive and uh, uh, as we uh, mentioned the distribution systems tend to be uh, having lower x by r ratios compared to uh, transmission systems. Okay. So, if you are uh, in the case when you add a LR you can see that uh, your uh, x by r ratio is going further up, uh, but when you go further down into the feeder you do not see much of a difference uh, on the x by r uh, ratios uh, because your resistance term of the feeder is now dominating that ratio. So, uh, so again this discussion is to impress on you on some of the uh, thoughts that go behind how to uh, select a protection components for your uh, system and uh, also we discussed in the class how uh, these protection levels can get altered once uh, a, a DG unit is uh, added in. Uh, this gives you a flavor for uh, some of the issues uh, that can potentially happen. So, now we will continue with uh, the discussion where we had left off on uh, uh, 
islanding of a distribution system and uh, we had talked about uh, the different ways in which uh, a system can island. Uh, you can have uh, an intentional island or an intentional island. So, you might have an intentional island for power quality reasons and unintentional islands for a variety of reasons the up, upstream breaker might open. Uh, also, you we saw that intentional islands are uh, can result in uh, uh, situations where which, which you want to avoid where you could potentially damage equipment etcetera. And so, there is a need for detecting a, a situation of an un unintentional island and anti-islanding algorithms are ways of uh, detecting a situation of an unintentional island. And the types of uh, anti-islanding algorithms can be passive, active or it can uh, involve signaling. So, we started with then looking at uh, 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 model of a feeder. Uh, as a RLC circuit and then we started looking at the uh, situation where uh, you want to detect uh, by passive methods the situation of a uh, unintentional island and the problem can be simplified as uh, following okay, where if uh, circuit breaker upstream of uh, on the feeder is opened and the feeder has uh, loads are modeled as R, L and C a parallel RLC network and the DG is modeled as, uh, uh, as a source injecting uh, real and reactive power into the network. So, by monitoring your voltage at the DG, so you monitor the voltage and make a decision on whether to open uh, the breaker located at the DG. Okay. And so, then to analyze the situation we uh, uh, defined what the problem should be under uh, nominal conditions. If you have a situation where your power that is injected by the DG exactly matches the resistance uh, the power consumed by the feeder and if the injected reactive power of the DG is 0. So, essentially the DG is operating at unity power factor and if whatever reactive power is drawn by the loads on the feeder is exactly compensated that would correspond to a situation of a RL circuit which is at resonance at 50 hertz. Okay. Uh, another assumption that we had was that uh, the quality factor of this resonance is greater than 1 which means that uh, the effect of the LC oscillations is dominating over the effect of any damping provided by the load or mismatch in between the load power consumed and the power injected by the DG. Okay. So, uh, so, if you have a situation where uh, exactly the loads are matched and the with uh, the power load power is matched with the DG power and the Q load uh, is that is being drawn by the load is 0, then delta P and delta Q would be 0 which would correspond to a condition where the, the uh, current through this particular switch S1 is 0 and if a current through a switch is 0, uh, it becomes difficult to say whether the switch is actually carrying 0 current or whether the switch is actually open circuit okay, because the current is in way 0. And the voltage over here would continue to oscillate because you have a resonance circuit which can continue to oscillate for a long time. So, now we will consider the situation where uh, we uh, consider the situation where you have some mismatch in uh, the power consumed by the load and the power being injected by the DG. And we will first look at the situation where you are trying to detect uh, uh, a situation of unintentional island by looking at the voltage magnitude. Okay.
So, the power injected by the DG and uh, uh, nominally and if the actual load on the feeder is uh, slightly different. Okay. So, if actual load R prime is R plus delta R, then uh, uh, you have now a delta P flowing into that uh, network. So, if you open the switch instead of having the original voltage V, you will have a different voltage V prime. Okay. So, if we assume that the power injected by the DG uh, is continuing to be the same as what it was previously, uh, the uh, original power was uh, V square by R. So, if it was continue, if it continues to inject the same power, because the power could be from uh, power command could be from some other uh, uh, controls. It could be from say for a PV system, it could be the MPPT tracking uh, which determines how much power is being injected. So, we will we'll have now V prime square by R which is R prime is V plus delta V square So, you could simplify this, you could you can then write delta R by R uh, simplifying this expression you can write delta R by R is 2 delta V by V So, you can get a relationship between your delta R and your uh, change in voltage to be expected. Okay. So, if you before the switch S1 opened, So, the power that was originally being consumed in the load was V square by R plus delta R, the power put out by the DG was V square by R. So, you can now write an expression for delta P by P, where P is V square by R. So, you can, so dividing this particular expression by V square by R you can get a expression for delta P by P uh, in terms of delta R. So, after simplifying this uh, expression, you can get this particular relationship between uh, your delta P and delta R. So, you could take 
the, the expression for delta r by r from the previous page and substitute it in this particular expression over here. Uh, and with further simplification, you can then express your delta p to be equal to or So, essentially uh, we can relate the delta p and uh, the voltages on your, uh, your circuit and we could uh, t consider v plus delta v to be corresponding to the situations of upper thresholds and lower thresholds. So, we can take v plus uh, delta v to co correspond to some v max and v minus delta v to correspond to some v min and then you can actually write an expression relating delta p by p to uh, v max and v min by substituting in this particular expression. Okay. So, you can write v by v max So, this gives a way of uh, relating how much uh, uh, difference in power would lead to what change in voltage once a upstream breaker opens. So, we will look at uh, a few example numbers. So, for example, if you have a feeder, say if the load on the feeder is less than the dg uh, power. Okay. then essentially what you would expect is uh, your injecting power back into the grid and if a upstream breaker opens you would expect a higher voltage on the feeder. So, if P L is uh, 0.8 per unit and P D G is 1 per unit then your delta P is minus 0.2. So, you can write an expression for V by V max one uh, plus delta P by uh, by P. So, this is equal to. So, essentially if you uh, look at what V max is. So, you can see that in this situation where the load power was uh, 80 percent of uh, what was uh, being uh, consumed uh, being injected by a DG unit, then if you open an upstream breaker you could expect uh, about 12 percent over voltage. Uh, so, uh, if you had uh, over voltage relay at the DG which was detecting say uh, 10 percent over voltage. Uh, at 12 percent over voltage it would immediately say open your DG breaker and disconnect the DG. So, you would be able to detect a situation of unintentional island. Okay. So, if you do a similar exercise if uh, delta P is uh, minus 0.5 which means that if the load was only 50 percent of the power that was getting pumped, pumped in through a DG unit you get V max of 1.4. So, you get a much higher over voltage if you are, uh, your, uh, your, your power being pumped in by the PG is higher. Okay. Uh, of course, you at a voltage of 1.4 you can damage the DG uh, damage equipment you do not want the voltage to go that high. So, here we have a quite a few assumptions we are assuming the leader the feeder to be 
uh, uh, RLC uh, uh, components and we are assuming that power injection is still happening at a constant rate. So, beyond some critical limits you might these uh, assumptions may not be valid, but definitely you will see an over voltage. Okay. So, you could also look at the other situation where uh, say uh, the other situation where your DG power is much less than the load power that might be more common where your DG might be uh, a few solar panels and your feeder might be uh, uh, having a much larger total loading. So, if you look at a, a, a case where So, we will assume that your power that is being pumped in by the DG is uh, just uh, half of your feeder uh, load power, then delta P is point plus 0.5. So, you have V by V min So, in this case where you your feeder power uh, your DG power is 50 percent of your uh, feeder power, then as soon as your uh, upstream breaker opens, then the model indicates that your uh, voltage would settle down at uh, 82 percent again assuming that your DG is still injecting the same level of power. Okay. So, in this case say suppose you have uh, a, 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 a relay which was looking at under voltage and you set your under voltage relay to 85 percent, then it would disconnect the DG because the DG would be seeing a under voltage in this case. So, here you are looking at just the voltage and based on uh, the voltage you are determining windows and De, uh, depending on the mismatch between your DG power and your uh, uh, your load power, then you could uh, see whether there is a greater chance of uh, forming an uh, unintentional island or is there a remote chance of forming an uh, unintentional island. So, in case where you have just a few solar panels and your uh, feeder power is in megawatts, then the chance of uh, an unintentional islanding is small, but if as the penetration of uh, DG units become more, then you have greater possibility of uh, forming an unintentional island. So, next we will look at uh, how you could make use of again the RLC model of, uh, uh, of the feeder and then make decisions on whether there is an unintentional island or not based on frequency. So, depending on what your L and C values are, you can have frequencies which shift from your nominal frequency. So, based on the feeder model we can write down expressions for uh, what the change in frequency would be and use that to determine whether an unintentional island has been formed. Okay, thank you.